All right, this is a one week standalone goodbye, tell it goodbye, uh, extended overtime session of first or last blood. First blood, we've, or last blood, this is last blood. This is really it, the last blood. Everybody's got one more uh, fight left in them. And, and so, quick review, because it's been a whole two weeks. Um, we ended last time by talking about that we have to move from a maternity room mindset to a battlefield mindset. And that was that conversation that Jesus was having with Nicodemus. If you remember, I know you all do, the series is really about how do we engage the world around us and find the identity we're supposed to have in trying to live the life we're created to live. We um, talked about the fact that the call of God is not a leap of faith, it's a life of faith. We're even hitting that again this morning in worship. That is a has such a recurring theme. We, I think that sometimes because we have watered down what Christianity is, we have forgotten that it really is to be an all-consuming life of faith. That's what we do. You exist each day when you get up to be light in the darkness. You may have another agenda, but at the end of the day, the reason God gives you life each day is so that you will do what it is that you were created to do. And so any day you don't do that, you have squandered the day. Um, and, and, and we don't we don't gauge our life that way sometimes. We don't think about that, uh, and we should. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, and 28, we talked about the fact that God gives us a new spirit and a new heart, okay? And that does change everything. So your heart, although we know we're not designed to do what it is God calls us to do, he gives us a new one. He fills in the gaps. Inside, we're not particularly led to do what we are supposed to do, but he gives us a new spirit. In other words, he re-equips us. Uh, and this morning we are going to hit and worship, and if you were here at 9 o'clock, you already heard me talk about this, that we spend so much time butting heads with God because he's not doing what we want him to do in the way that we want him to do it. And we get so frustrated by that. And we waste the life that we've been given by missing out on what it is that God has done. He understands, but he's told us what we need to know. And so we have a battle that we are in. Now let me flip this around here. This is stuff you've seen before. We started at the very beginning with Ephesians 1, 7. We talked about this bloodline that we become a part of and how the call of Christ is a call to an abundant life but that abundant life happens in this battle for the heart of humanity. The abundant life is not a vacation cruise. The abundant life, I mean, that's just fun stuff, but the abundant life is only lived and fleshed out when you start engaging the world around you with the love of Christ. That's where it happens. That's the life that God has breathed into you. That's why he's breathed life into you. And so we're not saved to be a spiritual zoo where the world can come and look at the lion in the cage. And we've put the lion in the cage, right? We have gone and decided that we will put ourselves on display, we'll lock ourselves into these things called churches, and we'll no longer uh, engage the culture around us. I told you a couple weeks ago um, that it doesn't take much to find all sorts of ways um, that the culture is always trying to push back on us. And I said I could give you lists of just what's happened. So I went back until the, uh, two weeks ago, these are, the story. These are just things that have happened in the last two weeks. Because some are going to say there's not a battle for the culture going on, and, and, and the people of God are not being pushed around. And I would say, ah, you're incredibly naive. These are the things that have happened in the past two weeks. This is not, all, this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. This is just in the last two weeks. Um, drag queens interrupted Kirk Cameron's story time reading in an Arkansas library. He's reading the kids, a Christian book that he has written. Drag queens don't like Kirk Cameron anymore. And so in protest, they interrupted in front of families and children who've come to hear this Christian author read this Christian book. And the drag queens disrupted it to the point where the police had to be called. Um, St. Mary's University has this week denied a new student group membership into the student group activity because the group is a Christian group that affirms in their statement two sexes, male and female, based on Genesis 1, 2, 3, and that's in their founding documents. And so St. Mary's, Catholic University, by the way, 
have said they're going to take God out of the mix, and because they've affirmed that there's two sexes, they're not allowed to have the freedom to meet as a club on campus. And that's the stated reason why the, the school turned them down. Last week at a church in Denver, um, we discovered, if you listen to their sermon, that Jesus was oppressed and he would have joined Black Lives Matter. <laughs> because Jesus at heart was a socialist and had a political agenda that lined up with theirs. A recent Wall Street Journal poll that came out a little over two weeks ago said, and the percentages aren't surprising, but this generation of Americans, and Americans today, care less about faith and patriotism. God and country do not matter anymore. The percentages have dropped now into the 30s of people who live in America who believe that God is important and faith is important. That would mean 70% of the culture does not. That's the world we live in. And so when I say, I'll have one more fight left in us, we're in a battle for the culture. And you, and you don't have to embrace it and say, well, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I mean, you don't have to, but it doesn't change the reality of what is. Uh, there's more news. Um, we also just celebrated our, the Trans Day of Vengeance. You'll remember that. That was a biggie. Um, right after the shooting in Nashville. Um, a Wayne State University professor said it is more admirable to kill a transphobic, racist, or homophobic speaker than to just shout them down. Instead of shouting them down, it's just better to kill them, assassinate them. Uh, it took them two weeks before he was removed from his position. They decided that probably was not the best thing to say. It took them two weeks to figure that out. <laughs> I, I, again, uh, Riley Gaines, uh, you've seen the name Riley Gaines, she's a swimmer out of the University of Kentucky, um, who, who had enough guts to stand up and feel like that um, she had been wrong when Leah Thomas, uh, who is a man, now a woman, won the NCAA tournament. Now, Leah Thomas is ESPN's Athlete of the Year, Female Athlete of the Year. Okay, um, and then we'll go back. We're going to talk about this again next week in worship, though. And what I said a couple weeks ago, we'll elaborate a little bit, where the battle of the sexes is over, if you did not know. Men can do everything better than women. Most of the Women of the Year awards have gone to men this year. So, ladies, <laughs> I would be up in arms. I would be upset. I would be, I would be rattling every phone that would listen. I would be clanging it from the bell of the church tower, but I'm, I'm a guy. I'm on the winning side. That's a man, man. <laughs> a man. A man. man. Uh, but R Riley Gaines went to speak on a university campus and was attacked by a man in a dress, assaulted in the hallway. They have it on video. Um, as of today, the police have not arrested that man for assault. I have no intention of doing so and will not charge him, according to the police chief. The Texas VA hospital has now, because of public outcry, this is in Texas, by the way, this week removed the cross from its lobby because the symbol of the cross offends people. The new mayor, newly elected mayor of Chicago, is now going to send therapists instead of police officers to respond to 911 calls. See, any of you that thought that it was going to get better in Chicago when Lori Lightfoot didn't get reelected, yeah, well, it didn't change, okay? The new mayor is, um, is very much about defunding the police, and so we'll be sending in therapists on 911 calls. Unarmed, by the way. Unarmed therapists. Um, Oregon, uh, the state of Oregon has banned a Christian uh, family, a mother of five, from adopting because the mother has stated that she is a Christian and will raise the child in a Christian home and because of her religious beliefs, Oregon has now said you will not be able to adopt here in the state of Oregon. And while that's getting ready to go through the court system, the fear is that that will be the rule of thumb. So if you affirm your faith in Oregon as a Christian, you will no longer be eligible to adopt children. Now, surely it will get stomped on before that, right? We'll see. Disney is changing the lyrics to the classic Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid 
Because, you know, as the crab is singing, it looks like Eric is getting a little bit aggressive with the mermaid. <laughs> and he's wanting to kiss the girl, but he's going to attack her. So for the live version, they have gone back in and they have rewritten the classic Disney songs because Disney has lost its mind. Um, they're now going to clean up the Little Mermaid because it's politically incorrect and no longer woke enough for the culture that we live in. Michigan State University, if you had nothing else to read, and don't tell me, ask me why I read this, Michigan State University this week released a language guide, language that they allow and don't allow on campus anymore. Now, freedom of speech, this is not allowed now at Michigan State University. You cannot say the words tipping point, bonkers, or cakewalk. I will tell you, That's because those phrases are racist and bigoted. They're racist and bigoted. Now, they, you people don't, uh, you guys are not keeping up with the times, okay? I'm a little disappointed you guys are not quite woke enough for this class. Um, uh, tipping point, bonkers, and cakewalk, um, racist and bigoted. You can no longer use the words founder, as in founding father, tribe, minorities, or American because those words are trigger words and will trigger a reaction and there's not enough safe places on the campus for those students to go that are offended by those words. These words are now ba uh, 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 banned. Christmas trees, holly, reindeer, <laughs> bunnies, Easter eggs, eggs, and chicks. They are religious, bigoted, words that will trigger reaction among students who don't share those belief systems so they can't be used on the Michigan State campus. And you cannot use the words um, conquer, powwow, or frontier because those are all racist terms associated with a bygone era. Also, just so you know, because the initials kind of get confusing, um, there are some other phrases that are not allowed that are initially bound, and I will give them all to you and then tell you why they, why they have banned them. This is still Michigan State University. POC is no longer an acceptable set of um, uh, letters. POC, that's people of color. You can't refer to someone as POC. You can't call someone a person of color anymore. That's, you know, I do that. You can't call them, you cannot, you cannot use the phrase BIPOC. That would be black indigenous people of color. Okay? You cannot use Q-T-B-I-P-O-C. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. That's why they printed it. That stands for Queer, Transgender, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. They're also banned because none of those phrases are inclusive enough. They don't have enough initials. They don't have enough letters. So what's the penalty if you infract? Oh, they can get kicked out of school. Oh, yeah. And so this is the Michigan State University. They have printed now an official language guide that they have adopted. Their Board of Regents has adopted it. It is now part of Michigan State University. And I share that with you. That is just in the last couple of weeks, okay? Now, again, so when I said to you early on in the series, I can give you chapter and verse and story after story. Some of this stuff uh, I even get to comment on from time to time because of, of who sends it and, and what they're trying to do and the pushback against it. Now, there's a battle that's going on, but this is two weeks' worth of stuff. And I, I mean... This is easy. I have to go digging for this. This is just junk that's still sitting around my email box that haven't been dropped out yet. Now, and you say, well, I don't deal with that every day. No, you don't. And that's great. I hope you don't. But the world does. And that's the world that we're called to step into spiritual battles with. I mean, we're fighting for the heart and the generation of our kids, our grandchildren. You're fighting for your, 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 you're fighting for your soul. And so when we talk about the fact that there's a battle and the mindset has to shift from um, maternity ward to battlefield, it really does become essential for us um, if we're going to try to ever, ever, ever crack the culture like we need to because this is, there's no, this is not a trial run. It's not a practice life and we don't get a do-over. This is it. This is, this is your moment. Um, Ephesians 6.12, I think we looked at this last time. Do you remember what page we were on when we quit last time? Okay, great. I started on page 48. Awesome. All right, Ephesians 6.12. Thank you. 
These are 612. Somebody read that out loud for us, if you wouldn't mind. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, I, 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 am, I am Southern Baptist through and through. I really am. I'm, I'm a good Southern Baptist. Most people don't think that, but I really am. I'm a good Southern Baptist. Um, I'm not sure what year of the Baptist faith and message I would fall under, but I'm, I'm a good Southern Baptist. Um, that's my theology. I mean, that's where I've come from. That's my background. I am, I'm just that guy. Um, and I can tell you this. I didn't grow up learning and understanding a lot about spiritual warfare. Um, because, it, because in Baptist roots, that whole talk about spiritual warfare was so charismatic, we couldn't talk about it. We were afraid of it. Because Baptists, by nature, are afraid of the Holy Spirit anyway. Because <laughs> we're, we're just scared to death that something might happen to us and we might get excited. And so what happens is, you know, Easter, Easter is that time of year where you get people and, and, and you're excited to get them to come to faith, but then you spend the next six months trying to calm them down. Because, you know, you don't want, Baptists are always calming people down, right? Yeah, oh yeah, it's incredibly, it's, yeah, incredibly difficult. And so we didn't talk about that, but if Ephesians 6, 12 would have a little cheat note above it, it would say basically, welcome to the war zone. Um, the battlefield mindset means that we step into an arena where there is a spiritual battle that's taking place all the time and it's happening all around us. I mean, you know, case in point, I just rattled off for you. I don't know how many, I didn't number them, but, you know, a couple weeks worth of stuff. That's just this, this is what's going on now. That's the easy stuff. That's the low-hanging fruit, which is crazy. And so we have to decide that we're not going to stand by and watch humanity sell its soul to gain the world. But yet, humanity seems to be willing to do that. And so then as followers, we can't give in to compromise so we can have comfort. See, a lot of us find our identity in com being comfortable. Being comfortable means there's just a battle going on around you and you just lose. Because when you decide to settle for comfort, you're now not willing to battle anymore. And as a result, no one's going to pick at you. Why? Because you're not going to make a difference. And the thing is, we say, well, I, I, we, we do this under the guise of, I don't want to offend anybody. And I'll say, I'm going to say this, and it sounds so crass, but for the love of God, love them enough to offend them. I mean, I don't want to offend somebody with the truth because I, the answer, you don't love them then. You don't love them. Love them enough to tell them the truth and say it in love. You're not winning a battle here. I get in arguments about faith a lot, but I never win. I never lose. It's just a discussion. See, if someone wants to fight, they just want to fight. You're, just, you're called to proclaim the truth and love and be light in darkness. And if we settle for comfort, because we compromise, and what we've done, we turn the lights out. Let's turn the lights out and go home. And by the way, if we, do, we as a ministry ever decide to do that, here's the deal. We're going to lock it up and just shut it down and go home. This is far too much work. This weekend was far too much work if we're not going to shine light into a culture. Because when I got to the house last night, I, I was tired. I mean, it, it, it was too tiring all night, man. I mean, it, it, it was, you know, and then an extra one for, for dessert. I mean, it's just, it's just you, because you know how bad you're going to feel the next morning when you get up. And you know what? It was just as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but you do it because... There's a battle being fought, and there's a culture out there that needs to hear and needs to see that there are people of God out there that really are living and breathing and trying to do something to reach the world. Um, we feel overwhelmed and underqualified, no doubt about it. But you're warriors. And you have gifts for the battle. Um, somebody go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. 
For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, as a follower in this day and age, these verses ought to be underlined in your Bible. Not that I'm telling you what to do in your Bible, but you ought to underline them. You ought to memorize them. Because Paul's reminded us that not only are we dropped into a war zone, but there's a war that rages within each one of us, but we have weapons that the world doesn't have. You're armed with truth, but you're also armed with stuff that, that will allow you to push back against the arguments of the day. His love will win the day. God wins in the end. There's this double war zone, though, that has, happens within us. We have to fight the battle inside because there's a battle on the outside. Most of us struggle with the battle inside so much we never think about the battle outside because we always are tuned in so much to what I need. And as a result, and I think it's one of the great tools of Satan, if I can keep the Christians worrying about who they are and what they're doing all the time, they're not going to think about anybody else. And so when we slowly start turning our thoughts to us, better your best. Let's be about self-improvement. Let's think good thoughts. And we stay there too long. We forget that the Christian life is not just about you growing. It's about you becoming. In Him, we live and breathe and move. Sometimes we just live and breathe. We don't move anymore. And we're not willing to, to be the warrior called to be. And so what happens is we're faced with a choice. And here's your choice. You can become a prisoner of war, but you're not exempt from the war. So if you choose not to push back, if you choose not to be light in the darkness, so that you have now become a prisoner of war. But the war is still going on. See, the war is a given. It has been since the first century. Paul wrote about it. Jesus talked about the fact that I've overcome. You don't have to sweat this. I've overcome. But there is a war that takes place out there. You're either a prisoner of it or you're fighting it, but you're not exempt from it. I can't imagine in anybody's sane head why they would want to be a prisoner of war. But yet... We allow ourselves to be taken captive by all the things that would prevent us from being the people that God wants us to be. Um, the reason that most choose civilized domestication is because when you do, the enemy leaves you alone. I, I'm convinced that one of the reasons we just choose, eh, you know, that faith thing, I put it at arm's length, it's a, it's a Sunday thing, you know, I'm good, I got my heaven ticket. I don't want to, I don't, I don't, 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 don't talk to me about growing. Don't talk to me about becoming. Don't, I don't want to use my gifts. I don't want to touch and change the world. I don't want to, do, I don't want to get serious about that kind of stuff. I just want my faith. It's, 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 it's kind of a personal thing. And when that happens, here's what you need to know. Satan goes, hot dog. They just surrendered. Because, see, he knows that you're going to heaven. He can't have your soul now. So he'll, he settles for the fact that you're not in the fight. He thinks that's a victory. Because see, when you give your soul to Jesus, okay, your soul's gone. He can't get you anymore. So how is he going to go after you? By getting you not to do anything. And for Satan, his favorite theme song is Another One Bites the Dust. <laughs> and it plays in a constant loop in hell. Because people are always just, you know what, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And we don't think that it's spiritual. Um, and Satan actually promotes that kind of activity. I mean, that's one of his greatest tools. When he gets you to focus on the comfort, convenience, and self-centeredness, then you ignore the whole idea of why you were created and what you were called to do. Satan loves it. Loves it. We decide, gosh, I just, just, 
I'm just going to keep this faith to myself. I don't want to offend. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want uh, anybody to think I'm weird. Don't want to think I'm odd. Um, I know the culture is lost, and now, you know, Pastor Jeff says we live in post-Christian culture now. Uh, so what can I? What can, it's just me. What can I do about it? And the answer is nothing, because that's what you choose. Or do you push back? Do you try to do something different? I got to tell you, I am encouraged by the fact that when people are walking out the door this morning, people are coming by me going, "This is who I texted last Sunday. They're here." There you go, baby. It's awesome. They said, it really works. I had one look at me today and say, you know what? I, I'll be back. I, I've never been to a church that's almost Baptist. And I said, that's great. She goes, you got a lot of energy up there. There was something happening up there. I really appreciate that. It's the Holy Spirit today. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, you know, so we're running, running empty. But when our faith becomes refined and civilized, it's no longer a threat to a dark kingdom. Remember our quote, right? You're a fighter. The worst thing that could happen to a fighter happened to you. You became civilized. When we become civilized, we're no longer a threat to a dark kingdom. That, that dark kingdom that Paul talks about, we're, we, we don't threaten. But I remember somebody saying one time, we have one king, one lord, one mission, and we're in a battle. We're in a battle. One king, one lord, one mission. We did a video about that a few years ago. I guess, Mark, let's, let's call that up this week again. Put Night Vision back up one more time. Um, great film, epic film. We went out to medieval times and shot it. We all were dressed as knights, and we fought for the battle of our king, swords. It was, it was awesome. We all got to play dress up. It was really cool. Um, Brooke's great lines, go, go, go. Um, Brooke, Brooke was awesome in it. Um, yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, but we have to understand that when you are on mission for God, you no longer respect the borders, the correctness, or the boundaries that are created by the principalities and powers that, that Paul was talking about. See, here's how I look at the culture. That Michigan State University list, that's created by the principalities and powers of Satan. Those rules do not apply to me. If I were at Michigan State University, I would have been expelled. I'd be expelled. I would, um, I would, uh, and, and for the church, I mean, I, and I, you know, I, heaven forbid, I mean, I, I know I know and I really love a lot of these guys that are trying so hard to be. It, it, it takes more than skinny jeans to be a good pastor these days. <laughs> it takes more than skinny jeans to be a good pastor these days. And part of the problem with that is there's pastors trying to get the skinny jeans that ought not to be trying to get into them. <laughs> now, I, 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 now, that's, that's a, a, a... Worship leaders need to hear the same thing. Um, but gosh, we just try to do that in our, in, our, in our tribes now um, because we're trying to fit into those places. Try, I know. <laughs> Expelled from Michigan State. The founders of the faith. Oh, wait, there's another word I can't use. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to have a powwow about what I, I can't use that word either. Um, you can't eat the deviled eggs. No, you can't. No, no more deviled eggs and no Easter eggs, for goodness sakes. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's what the call of Christ is. And I know, boy, I know this is Easter Sunday and and we're dressed up, and we're looking good today. But, you know, our call is to crash the gates of hell and not blink. Remember the fighter analogy? You get hit, and you don't blink. We need a generation of followers that will crash the gates of hell and not be afraid to blink. What will it cost you? It, it could cost you your life. Go to Nashville. Private Christian school. They did everything right. Keep school secure. You know, you know, doors locked. You know, shooter breaches the doors. Everybody moves just like they're supposed to. Just like they're supposed to. They get killed in the process of trying to save. 
little girl gets shot trying to pull the fire alarm to let everybody know there's a problem in the building. A little girl gets shot trying to save her friends. The police get there, and in 14 minutes, the shooter is dead. And right now, there's only one national news media station that will call the shooter transgender. One. The rest of them have said, we're not allowed to say that. I got news for you. Evil, sin, real hurt, all of it is a part and woven into it. it. We have a battle to fight, and we've got to quit apologizing for telling the truth. I had an email this week from somebody who said, I, yeah, you offended me a couple weeks ago. I said, I'm so sorry, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> because what they're offended by is truth. I mean, they can be offended by the way I dress, they can, my, you know, my, my non-skinny jeans. They can, be, uh, they, they can be offended by a whole lot of stuff. You know, and it can be personal stuff they don't like about me, and that's fine. That's fine. And I, you know, I might even say I'm sorry for some of that. But you know what? At the end of the day, I can't apologize for truth, nor will I. Nor will I blink when it comes to truth. Church people, I, I think, are being lulled into accepting ideas that are counter to God, or counter to truth. And, and it's not really by conscious choice. See, this is where the devil's good at what he does. It's not by conscious choice as much, by, but by the slow, steady reorientation of one's belief system. It just happens, right? It's the way that Satan worked on Eve. Did he really say this? You know, and we keep re our culture is trying to reorient us all the time to what's right and what's acceptable. Well, Michigan State is trying to do that, right, with that long list, right? Let's re reorient. If you say these things and you don't use this language, people will get along better. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And it's not that you're looking at that you're, not, you're not looking for people to offend, right? I mean, you don't you don't go out looking to offend people, but you also are free to say what you need to say. Do you think that all this also would cause people to get triggered and be offended more easily? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think being triggered becomes a lifestyle for some people. Yeah. We get up every morning expecting that something this day is going to trigger me. And what happens when we get up that way, right? I get up every morning, I expect to feel bad today. So later on, I'm going to feel bad. It doesn't matter. Something's going to happen. I'm going to feel bad. We, we get up with that expectation. You know, we get up with the expectation that I'm going to be miserable today. Well, guess what's going to happen? You'll be miserable for a day's over with. Or you get up in the morning with the expectation, uh, you know, you know man. So I think a bunch of people that are spring-loaded to get triggered. By All the time. All the time. Just waiting. Just, just, just waiting to explode. And they're looking for it. You know, and most of them have their phones ready to capture it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The camera's ready to go, right? Um, you know, and, and, and again, we are, we are, um, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is. Right. It is. And, and, and we, and you don't want to confuse passion with truth. Okay. Cause real truth will ignite and aim passion. Passion does not contain, does not control or contain truth. So you can be passionate about not liking Riley Gaines. But what she's saying is true. Mm -hmm. So the truth is aimed for passion. The passionate people who hate her, they're just passionate, but they don't have truth. I mean, it, it is that, it is that when, truth, when truth is done in the right way, it will take and it will funnel your passion where it needs to be and allow you to use truth to impact the world around you. Oh, my goodness, in a powerful way. A recent... IPSOS study. I have no idea what those initials stand for, by the way. I, just, I, I didn't write that down, and it just on me like, I don't know what that means. But this was a study, so it was a really good study. I wrote it down. Three out of five people employed in America believe that expressing political or religious beliefs in their workplace will result in a major backlash among the people and the companies they work for. 60%. Feel like they can't talk politics and they can't talk religion in the places they work, or there will be a, a, a huge backlash, a price to be paid for that. Um, one in four, so 25% of that same survey group, 
know someone who is disciplined or fired for expressing religious beliefs. And so that means then, okay, for a follower then, what do we do? We have to learn to make sure that the passion we have is driven by truth. Do we have to figure out creative ways to say what we need to say? Yes. Do we have to work harder at it? Yes. Uh, do we have to be better at playing, quote unquote, the game of life than those that might oppose you? Yes. And if you don't do it well, or do you still run the risk of getting caught and tripped up? Yes. And are you willing to pay the price for that? Yeah. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> or no. And, and, and the no that pops up sometimes is what causes us to <gasps> catch our breath and step back this a little bit. <sighs> so then we spiritualize it. Well, if I, if I'm going to lose my opportunity. Well, you've probably already lost your opportunity. If you ever have that thought that runs through your head, you probably have already lost it. If I do this and they're not going to listen to me, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, yeah, you probably already lost your arena to speak anyway. You've gone too far down the rabbit hole. I mean, we, we have to realize that the culture wants Christians to become uncritical members of society and to embrace the worldviews of a secular culture. And the forces at work around us that are trying to control the world have no vested interest in people being committed followers of Jesus. That works counter against what they are trying to do. Um, so resistance sometimes takes pushback. You have to be able to say, hey, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm going to push back on that with respect. I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. You're not going to force me to do that. <clears throat> I can't do that. Someone asked me one time not too long ago, how many letters of religious exemption did you write for people who didn't want to take the mandated vaccine virus in their workplaces? 22. 22. Looking for a religious exemption of why they shouldn't be forced to put something in their body. I didn't want to take. There were 22. Of the 22, 50% didn't have to take it. Now, I say that, I'm really disappointed. I mean, a letter from Jeff Dixon, that ought to be a gold standard. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I only got 50%. Um, and if I want to compare myself to others, most of the time, they had a 79% fail ratio nationwide. Even though they said you get a religious exemption, 79% of the times you could not. So I did better than most. We have to push back. Someone said, are you afraid to write this letter? I'm not afraid to write a letter. Will you write it for me? Sure, I'll write it for you. Tell me why you want to take Tell me why you don't want a vaccine. Tell me why you don't want to take the jab. I don't like Dr. Fauci. Okay, I'll put that in the letter. No, I didn't put that in the letter. I, I, put, it, I put it in something else. But here's, okay, we're out of time. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Um, yeah. Don't be afraid to take the battle that we're in and allow the world around you to see the love of Christ. We are fighting for something that's far more important and lasts for eternity. Um, this is the bonus session. Next week, uh, Dennis is going to be in here and he's going to talk about the attributes of God, which will be really good based on a Tozer book. Let's pray, uh, and we'll get on to worship. God, um, we love you. We're sometimes guilty of not paying attention to what it is that we were supposed to do. But Lord, help us to, uh, we don't want to be rude, we don't want to be obnoxious, but we want to be able to share the truth and love and push back into a world that's trying to make us be silent. We don't have to be. As God teach us that lesson, not just today, but for every day and especially on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.